Okay, let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of the Energy Systems Integration Group. I want to welcome you to our monthly webinar series and give you a little bit of background on ESIG. For those of you not familiar with ESIG, we're a membership-based nonprofit organization providing our members with objective information and resources for renewable energy and energy systems integration decisions. We do this <clears throat> through our workshops, tutorials, webinars, blogs, working groups, and technical resource materials. Our most recent activity was our annual forecasting and markets workshop, which was held online during the month of June during, <clears throat> due to the coronavirus. Our next activity is an online workshop from Australia, ESIG Down Under, during the month of September. Our webinar sessions are open to everyone, so please feel free to register anytime on the ESIG website. Our workshops deal with a full range of issues associated with integrating wind, solar, and storage into electric, gas, and thermal systems. They also deal with the coupling to energy-consuming infrastructures, especially electric transportation, buildings, and industry. ESIG is a very unique organization, and I don't think you'll find anything quite like it anywhere else in the world. If you're new to ESIG, I strongly encourage you to follow up with us if you like what you hear, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. You can find us on the web at www.esig.energy, as well as on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Okay, just a few logistical matters before we get started. First of all, phones will be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid unnecessary distractions. For the Q&A, we have moved to the Slido platform, and we're asking <clears throat> attendees to ask their questions through Slido at slido.com. You'll not be able to ask your questions through WebEx. You should go to slido.com on your device and enter today's date, AUG18, AUG18, as the event code to ask your questions. The instructions are also at the bottom of the screen and in the webinar announcement at the bottom of the session information box on the website. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the question to allow you to cast a vote to help prioritize the questions submitted. We plan to wrap it up at the top of the hour, and an email with a link will be provided once the video file has been posted. We also plan to provide short responses to unanswered questions after the webinar, so please don't be afraid to ask your questions through Slido. Okay, so today our webinar is on the topic of the economics of flexible solar for electricity markets in transition. The webinar will discuss the results and implications of new research investigating the economics of flexible solar operation in electricity markets. This research was conducted as a partnership among First Solar, the U.S. DOE Solar Energy Innovators Program, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Based on registrations, it looks like this is another quite popular topic. The webinar will be introduced by Mahesh Mujaria, an old friend previously with First Solar, and presented by Stephen Dalkey, a researcher in the field of solar energy. Mahesh is one of the founders of RE Plant Solutions, a first solar spin-off, and a well-recognized industry leader in the integration of solar generation into the power system. Stephen has worked for nearly a decade as a researcher and analyst in the areas of energy and the environment, and currently is a fellow in the DOE Solar Energy Innovators Program. I feel very fortunate to have Mahesh and Steve here with us today. And on a personal note, I did take a look on LinkedIn last night, as I usually do, and I found that I have over 200 mutual connections with Mahesh and Steve. Based on the distribution, taking a look at where the connections are, I think it means that me and Mahesh are getting old, but Steve still has some time left. I greatly value the contributions of Mahesh and Steve to ESIG and the industry, and I look forward to what they have to say. Okay, just a short reminder once again to use Slido at slido.com with the event code of today's date, AUG18, to ask your questions. Now, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Mahesh, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks a lot, Charlie. I really appreciate it and appreciate your uh, uh, friendly remarks uh, about us. Um, it's, uh, it's indeed a, a pleasure to uh, talk about this uh, topic. And um, with that in mind, uh, uh, Steve Delkey, if you can go on to the next one. So what we're going to do in this uh, 
Uh, this one is uh, Steve Delk is, is the one who did all the work here, and uh, I, I will kind of give you a brief introduction uh, about how this uh, topic came about. And uh, let's go to the next one. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, we've been uh, a part of a solar, we've been working on this flexible solar technology for quite some time, uh, uh, as many of you might know. Uh, if you can go to the next one, uh, please, uh, Steve. Um, it, uh, we started uh, a project with uh, California ISO and Enrel, where uh, the question was, can solar plant provide essential reliability services? And uh, we, we took a 300 megawatt PV plant that was being built and uh, demonstrated many of the capabilities that are in this report that is uh, highlighted here as well. It won uh, an outstanding project winner uh, award uh, uh, in 2018 and in 2017, even the NARUC uh, award winner. So let me give you an example of what we mean by that. So if, Steve, if you can go to the next one. Uh, so if you imagine uh, in this plant, and these are all actual data, the plant uh, was uh, producing, uh, out, would have produced output as kind of shown by the green line. If you go to the next one, uh, we allowed the, the, uh, in this case, California ISO uh, to uh, send a signal within a 30 megawatt headroom. Why 30 was a configurable number. We just took 10% of the plant capacity. And ISO, if you go to the next uh, one, uh, sent a, an AGC signal. This is automated generation control signal every four seconds. And then if you go to the next one, so this was what the plant was commanded to and uh, the, the, the orange curve that you see or a yellowish uh, is the measured power. And the, the remarkable thing about this is that the measured power was for right on top of the commanded power. And, and um, if you go to the next one, it kind of shows that this regulation accuracy was about 27 percentage points more accurate than the best conventional generation that KISO has its in its fleet, uh, fast gesture. Now, this is not because it is solar, but this is because uh, inverters, in particular power electronics, can react really uh, very rapidly. And also the control system that we developed for this particular, not for this one, but we control system for all the PV plants that First Solar has built, uh, has the ability to react much faster. It's a loop of about 100 milliseconds. So this is kind of, uh, was a quite a remarkable result. And the importance of this is that as we increase the penetration of renewables, we can actually provide this uh, kind of services from PV plants as well. Uh, if you go to the next one, Steve, you will see that we can provide AGC up regulation, down regulation, frequency regulation, like uh, this is AGC, of course, but uh, that can support as well. And one additional thing is flexibility. And so if we can go to the next chart, uh, so subsequent to that, we too, undertook a project uh, with uh, Tempi Electric. If you go to the next one as well, Steve. Um, uh, where we were able to show that in this case, Tempa Electric uh, was interested in uh, adding solar to their generation portfolio. And they were thinking of adding about 600 megawatt of solar. And in this uh, particular uh, example, we took that um, uh, their generation portfolio and add, uh, added about 2,400 megawatt of solar. So much larger proportion than they were even thinking about and demonstrated that if we can use solar in a dispatchable manner where it provides regulation reserves um, rather than just being curtailed uh, a priori um, that uh, if you hit one more time, Steve, sorry about that, but then the, the overall solar um, curtailment over the annual period goes down by 60% just because uh, the solar is much more flexible and can do regulation results, one more, Steve, if you don't mind. Um, and that shows that we can, uh, they, their, their dispatch portfolio, by the way, this was done every five minute dispatch and uh, uh, using uh, Plexos as the, as the tool for doing this. Uh, this was study carried out with uh, E3 uh, and Tempa Electric. 
Uh, so then they they commit less uh, thermal generation to provide the the, the means of uh, managing the grid. And so that's uh, one more, if you don't mind. And uh, this is uh, published uh, in in one of the reports. So what I'm showing here is that First Solar has been pioneering uh, in in this area. And uh, when we started, um, uh, had a meeting with uh, Steve almost a year and a half back or so, he got interested in uh, exploring this topic further. And uh, he was uh, a D Department of Energy scholar, as Charlie mentioned it, and uh, we uh, took him on um, as part of uh, a First Solar's program. And uh, next, uh, he, he did he carry out the studies that we are uh, we are um, very pleased to share with all of you. So with that in mind, uh, take it away, uh, Steve. All right. Thank you very much, Mahesh, for the introduction and the context. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, glad to see so many folks listening in. I'm here to present uh, some new research we've been working on that builds on the body of, of work that Mahesh just described. Um, as was mentioned, I conducted this work as part of a DOE Solar Innovators Research Fellowship. Um, for me, it, that was sort of like a non-conventional postdoc. Uh, I started after completing grad school. Um, it was non-conventional in, in the way that the, the program designed to promote applied research into solar integration and also um, uh, support partnerships with industry um, and other folks, uh, other stakeholders. So uh, we partnered up with Mahesh and First Solar. Um, we brought in NREL as a partner later on um, as, a, as another hosting organization. So I'm grateful to all three of those institutions for supporting this work. Um, and I'm happy to share it with you all. So uh, let's just dive in here. Uh, so the, the report has been published. Uh, link is provided at the bottom of this first slide. Um, it's no secret that as uh, renewable penetrations rise on electricity systems, um, flexibility services will, uh, will be um, more in demand by system operators to help manage um, increasing variability. Uh, Mahesh described uh, the work that's been done to demonstrate how solar can be flexibly dispatched uh, and done so in, a, in an accurate and high quality manner to provide system flexibility during certain periods uh, of, of the day. And so what we did is uh, we built an economic model uh, to study the impacts of flexible solar operation in a, in a relatively large organized market. Uh, which was California. Um, what we found is, is at a 30% annual ener energy penetration from solar production, we, our model shows uh, savings, system cost savings in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, by moving from a must run solar operation regime to one where um, solar is actively managed in a dispatchable, flexible manner. And we'll talk more about what that means from the perspective of our model as we dig in. And then uh, we'll conclude with a brief discussion of, of our thoughts on uh, the implications of what this means for um, the institutional and, and policy and market rules um, surrounding and governing the production of solar energy. So to start, why did we pick California? Uh, other than the fact that we started this fellowship, I was working out of First Solar's San Francisco office, um, partnering with their staff. But more importantly, um, California was a good test case as a large electricity market uh, comparable in size to, uh, um, to a variety of, of European countries like the UK or France. Um, and California has today relatively high renewable penetrations that we expect to continue to grow. Um, SB 100 is uh, legislation that currently uh, defines the state's energy goals, which includes a, a, a target of 100% carbon-free energy. So um, this 
the uh, implications for renewable energy integration will only uh, increase uh, within this market uh, and many other markets around the world. So this chart here just shows a little context of um, maximum solar penetration by month from the real-time market uh, and shows the growth in renewables in the Cal ISO market. Um, hitting last spring or spring of 2019, 70% uh, maximum penetrations of both wind and solar. Um, and, and you can see the steady growth over the last half decade or so. And then this is a map just kind of uh, laying out the geographic context of the region that we're um, capturing in our model uh, with the focus on the California markets. Um, and the distribution of, of generating technologies within this region. Um, within California, you can see uh, the, the blue circles in the north central California are hydro, uh, significant amount of red solar generation kind of throughout the entire Central Valley, as well as um, natural gas capacity scattered throughout. I will point out one large nuclear facility here in uh, north of LA that, that is still operating for the time being and some interconnections with uh, states in the north, as well as um, Reno, Las Vegas, and Phoenix. So that's uh, kind of the, the bounds of our model geography with a particular focus on California. Uh, operational impacts that we're seeing uh, just by taking the data available from Cal ISO. Um, this is a pretty typical day from February of this past year. Uh, as you get large amounts of solar in the middle of the day, you get morning and, and then particularly large evening ramps when the solar goes online uh, around the same time or prior to the, the evening peak demand, leading to a large uh, system ramp that uh, creates operational challenges and is currently being met in uh, the California market by a combination of hydro, natural gas, and imports that uh, quickly ramp up in the evenings to, to keep uh, the system in balance. This is uh, being reflected in, in the prices uh, published by the Cal ISO market. So in 2013, uh, renew solar penetration was just a couple percentage points. Um, and the orange line there shows relatively flat um, average prices throughout the day. And uh, fast forwarding to today or last year, 2019, with about 10% or 11% annual solar penetration, um, you see the prices start to get depressed on average throughout the day when solar comes online and then um, uh, noticeable price spikes in the evening as that um, system rapidly transitions from uh, solar to backup capacity that, um, that tends to be uh, more expensive uh, to procure those uh, fast ramping services. And that's reflected in the average prices, which last year uh, hit $100 per megawatt on average uh, in the evenings. Um, and so this is, this is one of the primary value propositions for flexible solar that we're gonna be exploring in this particular modeling exercise. It's certainly not the only application, but one where we see significant amount of value um, in the California market at uh, current and, and, and growing solar penetrations, which is um, dispatching solar in a way to mitigate the evening ramp uh, during days when it's particularly costly to do so. Okay, so here's a really simple hypothetical example to show how this, this can generate system savings. So we just have three plants on this day, a solar plant uh, with the, represented in the yellow area, a, a slow plant that is lower cost, but ramp it constrained, uh, which is the light gray area, and then a fast plant, which is the dark gray. Um, that isn't necessarily ramp constrained, but um, is more expensive on a per megawatt hour basis to produce. So if we allow in this um, simple model, the system operator to dispatch solar flexibly, that is at any level below its maximum set point, um, when the fast plan is, is expensive enough, um, what you start to see is, is you see the operator, uh, a cost minimizing operator that is, um, start to scale back the, uh, the ramp up and the ramp down in solar in the mornings and evenings. <clears throat> and what that does is it allows the ramp constrained generation to um, better follow the net load curve. 
and supply more of demand from uh, this low cost energy. And you can see the cost savings in this simple example show up uh, with, especially in the evening, a, a reduced amount of generation from the more expensive fast plant, which is the dark gray area again. And so to, on this day, um, uh, doing doing this method actually reduces total system costs by a couple percent in between two to three percent uh, compared to the must take solar scenario. Um, I will note that that this optimization does incorporate a trade off. So as you dispatch back solar to provide ramp support, you're reducing the total uh, low you're reducing low cost energy uh, that is otherwise um, provided by solar. And so it's this trade-off between um, mitigating the need for more expensive ramping capability from uh, conventional generators and um, and, low, and maximizing low-cost solar energy. Okay. So now to the the, the bigger model that we built uh, for this research project. So we um, included all the generating units uh, in California and neighboring states, uh, consistent with the map I. Uh, showed earlier, and we set up the model uh, with 15 zones, including four external zones representing neighboring markets, um, which are uh, used to determine uh, supply and demand balancing requirements uh, as they vary across geography and, and to allow trade across uh, regions within the state. And this particular uh, economic dispatch model is capable of, of um, running at hourly or sub-hourly time intervals. So we add in um, transmission capacity constraints. We require uh, supply to equal or exceed demand in all hours or all time periods in the model. And we include operating reserves as a relatively simple function of um, uncertainty uh, imposed on the system by demand and uh, variable energy. So as, as demand and or uh, wind and solar uh, production is higher, then the um, model will require procurement of, of larger amounts of operating reserves. Uh, for all of the generating units, we uh, include cost parameters, including um, production costs, startup costs, as well as additional uh, unit level constraints, um, minimum and maximum power outputs, ramping constraints, minimum run times and down times. For the solar and wind plants, we match, we spatially uh, match uh, production shapes uh, from granular data we obtained from, um, from NREL, uh, from their integration data sets. And uh, we also imposed um, some relatively simple hydro um, energy production limits at the monthly level uh, to, to reflect um, uh, uh, reservoir constraints. So all this information goes into our uh, cost minimizing dispatch algorithm. And this model produces uh, for us um, uh, schedules, dispatch schedules for each generating unit in, uh, that, that is included, as well as associated production costs and uh, transmission flows across the system. And we've got in, in the report that was linked to below, there's uh, 25 to 30 pages of, of detailed methods right up that describes all of the data, um, model structure, et cetera. So um, feel free to dig in. And so to start, we set up a, a baseline model. Um, uh, in, in the baseline model, solar is treated as a, uh, what I'll call inflexible uh, status. So um, similar to, to how it has historically been dispatched, um, where uh, curtailment is allowed, but it's, it's only done largely for reliability purposes when the operator is unable to balance supply and demand. Um, and that's, that's in comparison to what we'll be calling for this modeling exercise, flexible solar operation, where the operator can um, dispatch solar to any level it chooses uh, in a in a quick flexible manner, um, as long as it's below its its uh, uh, maximum output for that period, uh, determined by the, the solar um, production shapes that we provided that were provided by NREL. And so the the um, penetration numbers for these two bookend scenarios uh, were 
calculated before curtailment or dispatch down was applied in the model. And I will say that we um, ran a bunch of inter interim um, scenarios as well with solar penetration gradually ramping up. Um, I'll mainly focus on these two uh, scenarios as, as kind of bookends for um, comparison in this model. And as I mentioned before, um, uh, baseline is, is uh, inflexible solar uh, as compared to the, the um, flexible solar scenarios where, where solar can be um, dispatched to any level uh, if doing so uh, maximizes system efficiency or uh, minimizes system costs. So here's a, um, a couple charts just showing the uh, supply mix by month. Uh, for, for the one year that we simulated at the base and the, the 30 percent penetration levels. So as we grow from um, 10 percent to 30 percent annual energy penetration from solar, uh, we see the solar energy um, replacing mostly natural gas production within the state of California as well as uh, electricity imports, which are primarily the units that are on the economic margins for most periods of the year. And you also see on the right-hand chart um, a reduction in nuclear output, not because it's a uh, lower cost on a per megawatt, or sorry, not because it's economically marginal on a um, dollar per megawatt hour basis, but more because the nuclear output is, is ramp constrained. And when you hit um, this level of penetration, uh, it's just not able to um, to match the, the the daily system ramps that, that we see. Um, when you get to these levels. And then uh, I mentioned even in the must run scenario, we allow reliability curtailments, um, which we start seeing. And most of these are concentrated in the shoulder months, particularly the spring when solar output is high and, and demand is relatively low. Okay, so here's a, a zoom in on a particularly challenging week from the baseline model, um, uh, at least in the 30% penetration. So uh, this, week in spring, um, demand is, is peaking below 40 gigawatts. And uh, on a daily basis, solar is almost pushing the system to its, uh, to its limits, where you see, um, you see generation ramped all the way down and then all the way back up in the evenings. Um, you see large amounts of exports soaking up the excess uh, solar energy and uh, large ramps in the evening uh, on the scale of about 30 gigawatts. So we can look at these ramps just to display them a different way. This is a, uh, in the baseline model with uh, inflexible solar. We see um, on an hourly basis, uh, maximum system ramps of about 15 gigawatts. And if you expand that analysis to consider ramps over a three hour period, um, the, you're hitting uh, up to 30 gigawatt uh, ramps. Um, and this curve just shows the distribution of, of hourly ramps throughout the year and how it changes at 10% and 30% solar penetration. Okay, and then uh, lastly, on, on the baseline scenario, uh, this chart summarizes uh, how transmission flows um, adjust uh, with, with relatively higher solar penetrations. So during periods in the model where, where solar is offline, we tend to see north to south flows from um, out of state and also throughout the state. And this largely gets reversed when we hit higher penetrations. So um, with large amounts of solar coming in the Central Valley and Southern California, as well as um, out of state to the Southwest, um, you see energy flowing in and uh, north throughout the state into the Los Angeles region, north through the um, Central Valley transmission backbone and into the Bay Area and, and on up that way. So um, uh, basically a, a complete reversal of flows when, when solar hits high levels um, compared to what we're seeing uh, without solar and, and today. So uh, that all kind of characterizes the operational challenges our model is showing at a, a growing solar penetrations. And so now what we did is we allowed solar to be dispatched flexibly and study the, the changes and the economic impacts that we see when we compare the two. So I mentioned before, um, curtailment is, is really a, a reliability decision in the baseline model. Um, and now with flexible solar, anytime um, 
anytime uh, a dispatch adjustment to solar uh, reduces total system cost, the operator is allowed to do that. So we're really honing in on um, how can we flexibly manage solar to maximize uh, system-wide economic efficiency in these in these scenarios. Um, we see um, uh, setting aside the the um, ancillary services and reserve markets, we see a lot of this focused on um, ramping support uh, provided in the mornings and evenings, particularly on the challenging days when the system operator needs to go into the uh, far back into the, the dispatch stack to get the more expensive, um, very quick responding uh, gas units. Um, and so what what can what tends to happen on these challenging days is rather than fire up and use those more expensive gas units, the uh, operator actually scales back uh, solar um, during periods to, to minimize that system ramp and allow for lower cost resources to replace that energy um, that, that may have been ramp constrained in the previous scenario. And like I mentioned before, th there's this trade-off. We don't want to completely shut down solar energy because there's um, significant economic benefits from zero marginal cost solar. It's only when um, the, the ramping costs exceed those benefits when you start to see um, dispatch dispatchable solar activated in, in this manner. And it certainly doesn't occur um, every day or every every hour, um, even in the high penetration scenarios. We see a lot of it focused in the spring and the in the shoulder months. Okay, so here's a particular day um, where this did occur uh, just to demonstrate what what uh, can happen when you allow um, flexible solar at a high level. So um, the, the first thing that pops out when comparing the must run day on the left and the flexible solar uh, dispatch on the right is a, is a significant reduction in total solar output. Um, it's replaced by uh, reduced exports, increased imports throughout the day, um, some increased hydro, and, uh, and we see nuclear output actually um, showing up again on this day, um, which, which doesn't do any ramping in the model and uh, a reduction in the net load ramp in the evening by about three and a half gigawatts. And so just to summarize what this looks like uh, from a supply mix throughout the year, this is a, a chart showing changes in uh, annual generation by technology type uh, when comparing our flexible versus the must run solar scenarios. So the yellow bars in the negative direction show that um, the operator is scaling back solar throughout the year um, to help mitigate these system ramps. Doing so enables an additional reduction in natural gas units, which is uh, represented by those gray bars in the negative direction. Um, th those, are, those are plants that in the must-run inflexible solar scenario were required to, um, to, to balance supply and demand, and they're more expensive. In exchange, we actually we see in this model a relatively large increase in, in nuclear output, as well as um, imports into California. These imports are uh, largely consist of, um, well, the changes in out-of-state generation uh, are made up of, of hydro from the north, increased hydro, um, some solar thermal from Nevada, as well as some additional nuclear output from the Phoenix area. Um, and all of this is lower cost generation. That's that is increasing its output in the flexible solar scenario to replace these more expensive um, gas units that, uh, that are no longer needed um, to, uh, when solar can be dispatched flexibly. And this just summarizes all of that. So uh, we also were able to look at uh, locational value of, of flexible solar operation uh, from this model setup. Um, first, I'm going to talk about how we calculated this and then um, and then I'll kind of talk about the takeaways. So um, basically, when we do the uh, inflexible solar scenario, um, each solar plant uh, in the computer model is constrained to produce its output at the uh, pre-assigned um, production level from the solar, uh, solar insulation data. Um, that constraint for each plant is, uh, has an associated shadow cost, or conversely, uh, the relaxation of that inflexible solar constraint is associated with a shadow value, which is equal to the reduction in total system costs uh, when that plant can be dispatched flexibly. 
So for most hours of the year, um, that shadow value for each plant is, is zero. But when, uh, when we're in particularly challenging time periods with, with the system ramps, we see that shadow, that constraint bind, and we see that, see that shadow price um, become non-zero. And so um, what, what we do for this uh, particular map is, I, is we took uh, all of those um, shadow values for each plant, summed them up across the year, and, and plotted them uh, as represented by the red circles on this chart. Um, I also included these blue circles, which just are uh, scaled, uh, scaled uh, points um, that represent the size of each of those plants. And I placed the blue circle behind the red circle for each plant. And so what that does is it allows you to look at um, wherever you see blue circles showing up behind a red circle. That means that um, there's a relatively large plant that's not producing as much flexibility value uh, compared to the other uh, solar facilities across the, the model region. Um, so um, uh, let's see, so there's you know some, some larger plants showing up in kind of north central California that may not have as much uh, value available from flexible operation. Um, and that's not necessarily bad. That means that those plants are just in the model continuing to produce at, at close to their maximum output. Um, we see pockets of, of large solar flexibility value from plants in the Los Angeles region, as well as Southern California along the um, border and in the uh, Las Vegas region. And those are um, near constrained transmission lines uh, where uh, relief of those constraints enables some uh, more of that um, ramping support to provide value and allow the generation mix to switch from that backup capacity to um, perhaps bringing in some of that lower cost um, uh, generation like the nuclear and the solar thermal and the, um, and the other imports I mentioned before. So um, moving on to summarize the, the overall model impacts, um, looking at the whole, looking at the entire year, uh, that we modeled at a 30% annual energy penetration, we see um, uh, flexible solar reducing total system costs by $172 million um, compared to the, the inflexible solar scenario. And this increases uh, when, we include the, um, when we include neighboring states in that calculation. These cost savings arise, as I mentioned before, from um, ramping support. We see a significant reduction in uh, system ramps on the particularly challenging days, and that allows uh, that allows the operator to shift from more expensive um, ramping backup capacity uh, met by natural gas primarily to um, more inflexible but lower cost uh, steam turbines uh, in the form of nuclear, solar, thermal, and some um, some hydro that previously was was constrained by their reservoir limits. This uh, actually, uh, even though there's some reduction in total solar output uh, from this provision of ramping support, we actually see total uh, greenhouse gas emissions declining when we enable flexible solar operation in the model um, because of that shift from um, backup natural gas capacity towards those other, um, those other lower cost options I described. Okay, so all that be said, we've, you know, with this study and the past work that Mahesh described at the beginning, um, we were showing that there, the plants are technically capable of doing this. Um, that's primarily the, the work Mahesh described. And we're also showing with this study and, and past studies work by E3 and others with Tampa that there are economic benefits to doing so, um, particularly as, as renewable penetrations continue to go. Uh, to go upwards and increase. So from a market design perspective, um, the status quo is largely uh, supportive of maximizing low cost solar energy whenever possible. And curtailment is generally a, a, a thing we hope to avoid because uh, it means that you know, we're, we're doing so for reliability reasons. And we're not thinking about this from a system-wide economic efficiency perspective necessarily at this point. Um, and so what, what needs to change for this to happen? Well, lots of um, market operators around the country and around the world are starting to look at procuring um, more reliability and flexibility services through the development of market products. 
And from a um, market design perspective, uh, technology neutrality is often a core principle. And so, you know, our perspective with all of this is that, you know, during certain hours of the day or certain periods, um, solar is able to provide some of these flexibility services um, at a comparable performance uh, and at lower cost than the conventional options. And so that just needs to be eligible uh, to be provided through the, um, these, these flexibility services. Um, and, and we acknowledge that, you know, th this is uh, available during the days. It, it's available for, to support ramping during the evenings. Solar is not online all the time, um, but uh, during the periods when it's capable of doing so, um, economic efficiency can be enhanced by allowing solar to, to provide these services. And then um, once, once this is put in place, the other aspect are, are the, the institutional and legal contracting arrangements that, that govern um, solar production. Um, PPAs largely reflect the status quo operation as well. Um, they incent individual plants to maximize energy output that will maximize the plant owner's revenue and try to do as much as they can to mitigate um, curtailments. Curtailments penalize plant owners financially for the most part. But as we start to move toward the system where um, solar can not only provide energy, but it can help provide flexibility services um, and through through market design can get compensated at these uh, for these flexibility services uh, when doing so enhances economic efficiency for the system. And we expect these contractual arrangements to evolve around that and move beyond a, a, a paradigm where um, maximizing energy output is no longer necessarily the primary objective of a, of a solar plant owner. Um, rather, the, the primary objective becomes maximizing system value, whether that comes from ener low-cost energy production or flexibility services. So just to wrap up now in conclusion, um, uh, system flexibility can be enhanced through a variety of measures. Um, uh, providing flexibility from a solar plant is just one component of a larger portfolio of flexibility services that operators will um, be looking at. We built a model to look at this particular aspect um, specifically where uh, solar flexibility can provide ramping support to a uh, high penetration system in California and found uh, significant system benefits and savings to doing so. Um, these savings primarily come from ramping support and mitigating the need for more expensive backup natural gas capacity. Um, and we just briefly talked about some of the wholesale market evolution that uh, we'll hopefully um, see in it uh, going forward to accommodate uh, this type of growth in the system. And that concludes uh, my formal presentation. So uh, turn it over to the Q&A if it can be managed or however we want to go. Okay. Thanks, Steve. It's a whirlwind tour through the world of flexible solar. Uh, we've got a lot of questions that have come in here. Some of them have to do with storage. It doesn't look like storage was a, a primary consideration in your work, but let's just ask the question anyway. Sure. What's the break-even price for storage to make using solar-supplied storage for that evening ramp? Maybe I can uh, help address that question. Go ahead, Mahesh. Uh, when we when we talk about storage uh, versus solar, the thing to keep in mind is that uh, storage has a cost associated with it. Basically, the way I think about it is there's a charging cost, and secondly, it is a levelized cost of storage. So, if you were to say I have a three cent kilowatt el uh, electricity from solar uh, versus uh, eight cents to uh, cost of levelized cost of storage for that storing that electricity, which one is better? Uh, from an economics point of view, whichever is cheaper is probably better. So in that sense, I think that's how we have to look at that uh, from that perspective. So if the storage was free, then of course it would be the, the right thing to do in any case. And sometimes uh, storage is probably a much more yeah, cost-effective option then that's the right thing. Sometimes demand response is better, more cost effective in that case. That is the right thing to do. So I think that's a it's a it's a answer that is dependent upon what's the alternative uh, arrangement that you can make. Okay, so we'll have to uh, hold the study of alternatives for uh, 
a future iteration of this work? Well, uh, one thing I can say uh, to expand upon that, and this uh, people can look at the, the, the report that we did with E3 and Bioelectric, where actually it was shown that by having flexible solar, the value that is created by storage is somewhat pushed to the right hand side, meaning it's, it's a much, much higher penetration of solar. So that, that does indicate that sol, uh, store, uh, solar was more cost effective than storage in certain instances. Sure. Okay, thanks. Let's move on to the next question. There's a lot of questions here got voted up. We'll try to hit those. At present, what are the main barriers for implementation of flexible solar power plants at different locations and what must be done to overcome them? I presume that has to do with the compensation question. I'll start, Mahesh, and maybe you can add some color if you decide to. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, contractual and institutional inertia around how we've kind of developed um, solar production to date. So um, with, with today's PPAs, uh, curtailment's a bad thing, and it's not necessarily uh, mean that PPAs were poorly designed. It just means as we evolve towards a more flexible future where solar kind of dominates on a daily basis. Um, we need to think more about structuring these contracts so that um, the the plants can be operated flexibly and the operator is not um, limited to maximizing output at all costs and trying to deal with the rest of the system as a backup around this, this solar. Um, so you know we can you can evolve PPAs to include um, uh, th there's a variety of ways to do it actually and, and I'm not the one to to jump into those details and then the second component is is ISO market design tariffs um, as these flexibility products get implemented um, I think there needs to be a component uh, where where the renewable energy plants themselves are are considered as as possible. Um, options to provide those services and, and get compensation through those product structures. Okay. A little more flexibility all around. Mahesh, do you want to add something? Yeah, I was, <coughs> excuse me, what I was going to add was that the reason we took Tempa Electric uh, as one of the study examples is that they owned all the generation assets within their portfolio. <laughs> so they could optimize this. And what it showed is that it, be, it provides the economic benefit to the system. Now, how do we translate that into a system where the market forces, et cetera, is, is something we have to work through? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. The uh, next question, and just a reminder for those of you who may have come on late, we're using Slido at slido.com. And the uh, event code for today is AUG18, AUG18, if you want to follow along with the questions. So in comparison with conventional solar plants, are there any extra costs introduced with the implementation of flexible solar plants? So maybe I, I can address that. Um, is the, the most important thing that we have done in this, in, in able to provide this flexibility is to the control system so that we can control the overall output of the plant very flexibly, much more, uh, much faster than anything else. So the cost of the control system is a very small fraction of that. Now, of course, the cost associated with curtailing solar, which you would otherwise use, is a different matter. But as far as the plant itself is concerned, this is uh, pretty uh, insignificant, I would say. Yeah, okay. All right, a question on forecasts. Uh, do you know how errors in the solar forecast would impact the results? Yeah, I can take that. So we, we did a um, deterministic model uh, to make it computationally tractable uh, with the solvers and software we had. Uh, so we did not consider errors in solar forecasts uh, at a day ahead or, or hour ahead basis. Um, you know, that's certainly another component of, of having flexibility is, is uh, as penetrations rise, the magnitude of those errors in forecasting uh, can also increase. And so that's uh, that's where you start thinking about maybe adding um, other components to the design, like uh, Mahesh described earlier, leaving some headroom uh, in the solar output um, in case the forecast doesn't doesn't meet what's um, what is what we expect it to be. 
Um, but in general, when you're faced with uncertainty, you start to become more conservative uh, in that way, whether it's leaving headroom, um, having flexibility uh, just provides some additional value in that way. And that wasn't um, quantified in, in this particular model. Okay, I think. Uh, if, I may, Charlie, if I may, Charlie, if I may, Charlie. In the, uh, for, for those of who are interested, if you look at the Pampa Electric uh, study that we did, uh, the, yeah, the, that included the uncertainty associated with forecast by increasing the headroom and footroom required because of that uncertainty. So as Steve pointed out, in the in whole California system, it was hard to incorporate all that, but uh, it, it, it sort of gives us an idea of how to do that. And that was done by the, the E3 folks uh, quite effectively in that study. So something that uh, if you are interested, you should look at that. Okay, and a related question, I think you may have answered it, but just for the sake of completeness, we'll ask it again. How did you account for uncertainty in solar generation in deciding how much solar flexibility would exist, or was this a perfect foresight optimization? Yes, yeah, so it was a deterministic model, um, but we did uh, account for uncertainty through through a, a dynamic operating reserve requirement. So we don't we didn't model the um, uh, reserve requirements and ancillary services markets as they exist in, in detail. But what we did do is scale the required operating reserves for every given day um, according to the uh, demand and variable energy production levels. So when you have higher levels of demand, um, you you have higher uncertainty associated with that demand forecast. Similarly, you have higher uncertainty associated with wind and solar production when you have higher levels of that. So on those days, uh, as that's scaled up, the operating reserve requirement in our model is also scaled up to reflect uh, that uncertainty in an indirect manner. Yeah, very good, thank you. Uh, the next question, going back to storage again, solar outperforms thermal in following an ISO signal, but how does it compare to lithium ion storage which can also avoid need to limit solar below available? And yeah, maybe uh, I'll address that question. So I, in yeah. general, so the both storage and uh, solar are, are supported by power electronics. So performance-wise, they will do uh, pretty much the same thing. And so, yes, storage will do quite well as well in terms of following AGC signal. The second question is about which is more economical. And I think I answered that first question uh, by addressing the, the uh, you know whatever is the levelized cost of storage compared to the the, the solar that you are foregoing is, is how you need to compare. And uh, when you have a three cent uh, electricity, it's kind of hard to, hard to compete with that. Yeah, okay. The next two questions uh, I think we'll take together. Uh, is it economically feasible to implement flexible solar plants at distribution voltage levels or in standalone microgrids? And related, is the solar behind the meter capable of providing reserves? So maybe a little bit of uh, kind of what's going on in the world of aggregation and behind the meter with DER and what kind of services it can provide. So if we, uh, if I may, I would say the first question about uh, at the distribution voltage level. Uh, it, I mean, in principle, it can be because what we are doing is making the inverters. Uh, sort of uh, go down in power that they accumulate from the from the panel. So yes, it can be done even at distribution voltage level, et cetera, as long as the inverters and the plant control system can manage that. Now the question of behind the meter question, that one is a little difficult because uh, how, uh, I don't know how to, what to say about that. I mean, technically it can be done, but there are numerous other issues that I'm sure will come up in that context. Yeah, maybe we can get into more detail on that on another day. Um, a question here on, on value. How much of the value of minimizing system cost is transferred to the plant owner and how does the split of value impact flexible solar dispatch? That's a, a good and I think really important question uh, when considering the economics of, of this topic. Um, what our model did is, is it calculated the total system value or the total 
cost reduction associated with operating the system this way. Uh, we did not get into those distributional questions, but that is the next uh, that's the next step, especially in an organized market uh, with competition, is, um, is is working through those details, right? So clearly, um, the the solar plant owner, when it's dispatched down to provide system flexibility, um, incurs or receives less revenue from the energy market. It's not producing as much. Uh, its total energy revenue goes down. Um, so that's that's that is uh, without compensating that flexibility service, there is a, a market failure in that way, and that the incentives to maximizing uh, system efficiency are not aligned with the individual incentive of the plant owner. So I mean, it, you know, I, I think it's something that really just needs to work through the the social, political, stakeholder processes of these markets, not something that we addressed in this economic model. But, you know, from an economic efficiency perspective, if this, uh, the, the plant owner or the system operator is not going to dispatch down that solar plant, if doing so does not create value in addition to the lost revenue that the plant received. So there just needs to be a mechanism, whether it's through these flexibility products, to um, make that solar plant at least whole for the lost revenue, and and um, and, and then there's going to be a margin in between there where uh, it, you know the value savings can go to the plant owner, it can go to consumers through low, uh, it can go through uh, to load serving entities, um, or or some other mechanism that, that needs to be determined through the settlement process. Okay. And uh, the next one, I think this question we can look at on two levels, probably at the uh, transmission level and then the distribution level behind the meter. Why do you assume that solar is must run? Is solar forced into the system by the ISO? I thought they participate in the market, perhaps with negative bids. Yeah, so in, in the modeling, we, you know, I, I might have, I, I think I use the term must run. I think a better term that I like is uh, inflexible solar. So, um, you know, so solar is going to be, uh, from an economic perspective, uh, you want to take as much solar as as you can, subject to these operational issues, because it's it's zero marginal cost energy, um, and in some cases, as referred to, can be um, negative uh, if you include the, the subsidies um, or some perhaps some other constraints driving prices negative. But um, the, the the terminology used in this model in, in flexible solar means that um, the solar uh, is not going to be considered just to uh, for dispatch adjustments for from an economic efficiency perspective it's only uh, going to be curtailed when there's a supply and demand imbalance um, and we believe that that is is generally reflective of how um, uh, renewable energy operating procedures have have been uh, to this date in, in many markets, um, and and so that's what we mean when we use the term inflexible solar for for this model. Okay, and I think I'm going to take one more question. I'm going to jump around a little bit here and uh, take one of these questions out of order, and that is a question from Sue Haupt um, with NCAR. And the question is, would probabilistic information in the forecast be valuable for operating flexible solar plants? Uh, I, I think it would be. Um, you know, I, that, I think that's, uh, to the extent the ISOs are able to incorporate that data, we're, we're moving towards when we get to higher levels where, where uncertainty becomes a much bigger factor. And so, uh, any way you can um, more accurately capture that uncertainty distribution will only improve economic efficiencies. Uh, I'd be happy to drive up the road to to, uh, to meet up with the folks at NCAR to learn more about the great work on probabilistic forecasting that I'm sure they're doing. Uh, I'm about 10 yeah, miles away from them. So. <laughs> a lot of good work going on up there. A lot of um, implications of the probabilistic forecasting methods for the dispatch of renewable energy. Okay, we're uh, we're approaching the top of the hour, so we're going to need to wrap it up. As I mentioned earlier, an email will go out once the video file has been posted. And I also want to encourage you to send any follow-up questions to info at esig.energy, and we'll get them answered and posted as quickly as possible. We appreciate your engagement and look forward to seeing you at our next webinar series.
which will be the Australian ESIG Down Under Workshop in 10 sessions during the month of September. I hope you'll be able to join us once again and further information on all of our webinars and meetings can be found on our website at esig.energy under events and in our newsletters and informational emails and you're all invited to attend. Mahesh and Steve, I wanna thank you again for this very timely and informative webinar and thank all of you for your interest. We look forward to seeing you during the September Australian workshop. In the meantime, everyone, take care, stay safe, and thanks again for your participation. Bye now.